Chapter 4 Review You should go back and cover the four major types of tissues and what makes each of these specialized for their particular jobs. For instance, epithelial tissue is mostly made of cells packed tightly together, forming a barrier or a membrane between one part of the body and the next part of the body. This barrier can then regulate what gets absorbed or secreted from one place to the next. Connective tissues don't have many cells, but they are mostly composed of extracellular matrix, which includes either protein fibers or the more gelatinous ground substance. There are a number of different types of connective tissues, each with particular specializations. Muscle tissue. The cells here are capable of motion. For skeletal and cardiac muscle, the proteins that are involved in generating motion are organized in such a way that we can see them under the microscope as having a striped appearance. Lastly is nervous tissue. These cells can generate electrical signals and communicate with each other in large networks. To do this, the neurons and glia have long arm-like extensions that make connections to lots of neighboring cells. Both dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue are very strong, and that is because they are composed of primarily collagen fibers, the strongest of the protein fibers. These fibers are secreted by the fibroblast cells. Dense regular connective tissue has the collagen fibers running in parallel to one another, which makes this tissue very good at resisting tension in one direction. Whereas in dense irregular connective tissue, the fibers are running in all directions, meaning this tissue tends to be strong at resisting force in any given direction. Because most connective tissues are primarily extracellular matrix, when there is a large amount of injury to a connective tissue, we will require more cells than we have. That means that mesenchymal stem cells must migrate into this area and differentiate into the cell type needed, such as fibroblasts, in order to repair any damage. Cartilage is another type of connective tissue. The extracellular matrix is secreted by chondroblasts. There are a few fibers in the extracellular matrix, but the majority of the bulk is composed of ground substance. The chondroblasts secrete glycosaminoglycans, long proteins with sugar molecules attached that attract water and hold it into place, forming a gel. This makes cartilage slippery and particularly adept at resisting shock. One unique feature of cartilage connective tissue is that, unlike most other connective tissues, it is avascular, meaning it has no blood vessels within it. This makes it very difficult for cartilage to repair large amounts of damage to itself. For this reason, people might take a supplement of glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. These are two of the building blocks of those glycosamine glycans that make up the ground substance. Those proteins can also be found in the synovial fluid that we'll cover in Chapter 9. You should definitely review the four hallmarks of the inflammatory response following tissue injury, focusing both on why these are good for the healing process, as well as why too much might actually be bad for your patient. Following damage to a tissue, injured cells can release inflammatory molecules, like prostaglandins. These will diffuse just a short distance away and can lead to the vasodilation of nearby blood vessels, which will bring more blood into the area. This causes redness that we see. This increased fluid will bring more nutrients that we're going to need later for repair. It also brings in more white blood cells, 
which can clean up any damage in the area. The white blood cells can increase the permeability of these blood vessels, leading to fluid leaking into this area, which causes swelling. Increased pressure from swelling will limit the spread of damage. Remember, when cells die, they may release lysosomes, which could damage nearby cells, which could release lysosomes, which could damage nearby cells, and so on and so forth, in a process we'd call necrosis. So the swelling that we see can limit the spread of any damaging molecules that might be released from dying cells. Furthermore, this would limit the spread of any bacteria or viruses. The increased blood flow and fluid also produces heat in the area, speeding up any nearby enzymatic reactions, which can help speed up the healing process later. Lastly, the inflammatory molecules released by damaged cells can also bind to nerve endings and trigger pain, which will make the person less likely to put pressure on this area, helping it to heal. We also covered glands, which are made of epithelial tissue. Exocrine glands will have ducts and secrete substances to the surface of the body. That might be the outer surface of our body, such as a sweat gland, but it might also be the inner surfaces of our body, such as the stomach and intestines dumping digestive enzymes into the lumen or the hollow center of our digestive tract to help digest food. An endocrine gland, on the other hand, dumps materials directly into the bloodstream or extracellular fluid. Typically, these molecules would be hormones, sending signals throughout the body. An endocrine gland does not have a duct. Instead, unlike our other epithelial tissues, endocrine glands actually have their own blood supply, which makes them unique.